After five decades of war and over two million deaths, this is South Sudan, the world's newest country. I feel jubilant that what we have fought for, for over the years has eventually materialized. We have the land, we have the resources, we have the people. The new country that will be born will have people who will be thinking of equality, justice and good governance. But despite that outward optimism, it's already clear that things are far from well. As Southern Sudanese, we didn't expect to turn against each other and kill each other. Innocent people being killed, being burned, being shot like dogs. around South Sudan, they're coming home. Displaced by civil war, they're returning from exile in neighboring countries like Uganda, Kenya, and Ethiopia. A million alone will arrive from Northern Sudan. And they all have one thing in common, hope for the future in their own newly independent country. In a large canvas tent on the outskirts of the southern capital, Juba, lies the history of South Sudan. Thousands of decaying documents, photographs, and even paintings lie waiting to be sifted through one by one to provide the people of the South with a record of their struggle for independence. Many of these documents feature a name now firmly established in the memories of the southern Sudanese people. Joseph Lagu, one of the South's most famous rebel leaders and the man who led the first major rebellion against northern rule. You now have a new country. Was it worth it? Well, we have fought for it over the years, and it is worth it, yes. And we, our people are very jubilant now. They are happy that we have a state of our own. A respected veteran, and now a presidential advisor, he knows the difficulties lie ahead. There is no state in the world that has no problems. And uh, we are aware that we have some uh, domestic problems which are available, which are there in any country. And uh, we, 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 will be, we, will, we will manage them. <laughs> Former child soldier Lam Tungwa believes the sacrifices he and others made were worth it. I'm expecting and I'm looking at a very bright country with a lot of things in place possible. But I'm hoping that there will be a great democracy. Southern Sudan will go ahead and they will have a good government. But others like teacher Aban Raphael are worried that South Sudan is in danger of descending into a new period of conflict. The future is rather dark. Because most of the people, even the northerners, predicted that when South will be independent, when they are alone, they will fight among them. For the people of South Sudan, independence from the north was their goal, nothing else and 98% voted to create this new country. But as time passes, many who have returned from exile, like Jok Madut Jok, recognize the seriousness and scale of the task ahead. Our country as it stands today is an, a four-legged animal, but the legs are broken. The first leg for any government is a disciplined military. We have problems with the way our military functions today. That's a broken leg. We have civil society. Right now, it's very weak, 
It's focused on service delivery. It's not an advocacy-driven civil society. The third leg is delivery of services. It's hard to deliver security. It's hard to deliver schools and healthcare and markets and free, free enterprise. It's very difficult. So that leg is not functioning either fully. The fourth is political unity. We had political unity in the days leading up to the referendum. Since the referendum and since the, the vote overwhelmingly in favor of independence, we've been having difficulties uniting our ranks. That is a problem. So right now, the animal is standing on four crooked legs. If we don't fix these legs, the future is going to be very, very difficult. Many Southerners blame the Khartoum government in the North for undermining its transition to independence, spending the bulk of revenues from resources such as oil on developing its capital, Khartoum, into a modern metropolis. Half a century of almost zero investment has left the Southern infrastructure in a hopeless state. It shouldn't have been this way as most of Sudan's lucrative oil fields are situated in the south. But the pipelines run north. One of the most powerful figures in Khartoum believes the south will struggle as an independent state. You know, this is a, a country that's going to be plagued with so many problems. It's going to be landlocked under the mercy of northern Sudan, mainly for the export of oil. There is so much hostility between the the components of the population. Uh, and there's the, the factor of inexperience, uh, the lack of infrastructure, and the lack of state structure. But it's the military threat from the north, which for many poses the greatest obstacle to southern development. And nowhere does that manifest itself more clearly than in the disputed region of Abyei. Abyei for the north is a pawn on a, a chess table. In the south, it's a matter of life or of death for people who live there. Abye lies on the border between north and south. Largely populated by southern Dinka Nok tribespeople, it is also a passageway for northern Miseria nomads to drive their cattle to pasture and who often carry automatic weapons, which they say is to protect their herds. But there have been many cases of attacks on the local Dinka population. The South is demanding that the whole territory called the Bay uh, should be the preserve of, uh, of, the, of the Dinka. They, they, they wouldn't allow a single person from the Miseria to enter that region. The North adopts the position that this is, should be for both the Miseria and the Dinka. In May 2011, in a move they say was provoked by an attack on one of their convoys, the Northern Army, supported by tanks and helicopter gunships, attacked and took control of the region. Over 100,000 Dinka Nok fled south. At the same time, the government in Khartoum was accused of encouraging Miseria tribesmen to head towards Abye in what many feared was an exercise in ethnic cleansing. That area become a battlefield. It will be the people in the area, both the Dinka Ngok and the Messiria, that unfortunately will pay for it. For the northerners, it's a piece of land. It's nothing to do with people. So they are not interested in people, they are interested in the land. For us, we are interested in the people, but Abia is a, is a southern land, has always been, it will always be. If it is the single thing that we are going to go back to war over, make no mistake about it. Although the North agreed to pull out after negotiations, should war reignite as many expect, Khartoum believes the South will be no match for their forces. In order to maintain a war for a long time, you need resources. And I don't think they have the resources. And then in order to wage a long-term war, I think you need internal cohesion and they lack internal cohesion. Abia belongs to the, to the South, and it is hoped that Khartoum will come to its senses and give Abia back to the South. The prospect of another North-South war would bring devastation to the Southern people 
who were just beginning to believe that a return to normal life could be possible. But a frightening legacy, hidden beneath the ground, makes that a distant dream for many. It's estimated that more than two million unexploded landmines were left from the 22-year civil war. As the refugees of that war return to their homes, they desperately need land for growing food. So we have a very big challenge. Our people were intend to come back, and uh, we are trying to reclaim back the lands from uh, contamination uh, to a, a civil use. We thought we, maybe we can get rid of all mines in southern Sudan, but they take a lot of time, and this is what it is, time consume, consuming, uh, the mining work. Um, we know it is a dangerous job, but if you are still alive, we want to free other people from the danger, the innocent people. More often than not, it's the children who are the victims. When the war with the North ended in 2005, Many believed that at last, the nine million people of South Sudan could live in peace. But that dream has been shattered. The fact is that the South is already at war with itself. In nine out of 10 states across the South, ethnic and tribal conflict threatens to push the world's newest nation towards chaos. Militias who accuse the Juba government of fixing elections are now attacking the Southern Army, the SPLA. The rebel leaders accuse the government of favoring the Dinka majority and blocking minorities from power. People are running around right now Injuries, hospital is filled up with guys who are shots and dead people already buried and all that. With over 40 different tribes in South Sudan, conflict is nothing new. You have a society that has known war for a long time, whose legacy is widespread of firearms. It's become a fertile ground for such conflicts. Everywhere. Bentiu, Rumbek, uh, uh, Gulu, uh, Bolo, Mbolo, and everywhere there is killing. Is there a fear that intertribal violence will break even the South apart? Maybe. Maybe. We first met Aban Raphael in the border town of Malakal as he described how, during the war with the North, he and his family hid from northern attacks. The one image I remember so much is of you and your wife sitting by the bed you would hide under when the trouble happened. And now it happened again. It happened three times. Uh, people have to hide under the beds again. Uh, you have to wait for the bullet which is coming to you under the bed. Uh, even there was uh, somebody who was found under the bed and then bullet hit him and died. Mm. So anywhere, it is not a safe place to hide when there is shooting. But you try to protect. Yeah. If it reaches you there, it is your day, has come, okay. Near Aban's home, 
The hospital is overwhelmed with victims from a battle between the SPLA and militias made up mainly of local Shiluk and Nuer tribesmen. A fight between Southerner and Southerner. What happened to these children? These children, they have got their gunshot. They have got that they have wounded due to the gunshot. And the incident that occurred in the area called uh, uh, Kaldak, South Malakal. Three, four days ago. How, how many victims have you brought into the hospital so far? Uh, besides uh, some, some soldiers that have been brought and wounded, uh, the total number uh, was uh, 120 something. What happened to you? Among the civilian victims at Malakal Hospital, we find rebel soldiers and officers. They blame the Dinka-dominated SPLA for the bloodshed. <laughs> For a ban Raphael, war with the Arab North was easier to understand. During the war, you know this is my enemy. But now, you don't know who is your enemy. Because you are a tribe man, or a southerner like you, consider you more than Arab. You are more enemy than Arab. Members of the Khartoum Club in the northern capital had predicted this. They don't have the infrastructure to form a government. And there is trouble between the tribes in the south. They will go into war. You know, the biggest tribe in, in all, all the world is the Dinka tribe. The Dinka tribe want to rule all the tribes. If they give the other tribes a chance, then there will be a possibility of a viable state. Because in this country, they are very nice people. They have got very much resources. But how can you blend them together? Prior to the referendum on independence in January 2011, peace between rival factions appeared to have been achieved. But in the six months following, almost 1,500 people died. Thousands more were injured, and up to 200,000 fled their homes as violence raged across the southern states. One of the main rebel leaders, a former SPLA general himself, is this man, Peter Gadet, whose forces have attacked key towns in oil-rich unity state. I don't think the people are with him. He has no right, in no cause, to take up arms now. The government can be changed by the ballot box. But he claims the ballot box was adulterated. Wait for another. The elections are done periodically. If you lose one, you don't have to take to arms. Wait for another. Current SPLA leaders attempt to dismiss the rebels as irrelevant. That bravado does not reflect reality. The rebellion is, in fact, growing, and Gadet has publicly accused the SPLA of recruiting child soldiers to fight against him although the army denies this. The use of children in combat brings back horrific memories for many. Musician Lam Tungwa suffered as a child soldier himself in the last civil war. How long shall we be away from our now as our hope and dreams seem promising for a while after peace agreement just a mile 
as a child, I thought having a gun is a game. I have a real gun right now, and I can do whatever I want, and I, I will be a man, and then, you know, I, I, will, I will shoot somebody, I'll do this and that. It was exciting in the first move of having a gun. The worst moment I faced was the time the Dima refugee camp was attacked by the rebel group. The time people were chased to the river, and people have to just jump in the river with their babies and die. I've seen one man who cannot carry his three children because who will he take to the other side of the river? Does he always swim? So he commits suicide by shooting themselves, and they are dead because the enemy is right here. Lam spoke with relatives in Unity State. He says they confirmed that child soldiers had been recruited. I'm really feeling bitter about it, and I've managed to talk to a few people in Bantu concerning the same issue. Children going to war again and, you know, having to hold guns. Very bad. And in another reversal, southerners are laying mines once again. This time, against their own people. It's, it's very, very, very upsetting, and uh, I'm, I'm not happy when I hear that uh, that history of mines have been re replanted again in Jungle and Upper Nile and Unity State, yeah. This is not a time of fighting. This is a time of how to prepare ourselves for development. Because South Sudan has been a, been a problem for more than 50-something years. And, when we, and, and because we have been fought for the, for, the, for, for the freedom, and we got it. In the same time, I ask my people to pray. Those who have been in problem, those who love peace, they have to pray. Internal conflict is just one of a growing number of crises facing the new nation. Corruption is already endemic. Money goes to individual pockets, and so uh, that's why you see some people are rich. You could be afraid of, you know, losing your life. Press freedom under threat. They came back on, uh, on the set day and arrested me. Refugees from war being forced from their homes by their own government and even foreign raiding parties, which cross the border to kidnap and kill indiscriminately. They just appear all of a sudden and then start butchering these people. The 50-year struggle for independence has left a people traumatized by conflict, unable to survive by their own means, dependent on food handouts. This is Akobo, near the Ethiopian border, which the United Nations once deemed the hungriest place on earth after a drought in 2009. There was no single raindrop. There was no single grain harvested. And that has contributed also to loss of many lives. But today, the population is returning in the tens of thousands. And the fear is that once again, food supplies will dry up. Uh, people have started returning back to Akobo. There are a lot of hopes here in the air for people. The people here are hoping for the best. The next six months to nine months, we're expecting more more of 75% of returns to Akobo. That means the population is almost going to double. It's a problem which much of the new South Sudan is facing, 
large numbers of refugees coming home, full of expectation. But they're returning to a country where half the population already relies on foreign aid. Have outside agencies created a dependency culture here? Well, there was no option. There was no option for that, because people were on the run all the time, and what else could have been done? All the aid agencies should be focusing now on training people on how to look after themselves, not to be looked after. Because you know the Chinese proverb as well, give men fish and you, know, and you feed him for the day, and if you teach him how to fish, then he will, you will feed him for the rest of his life. Development specialist Niel Kowal believes the future for South Sudan lies in its land. A country the size of France with a population less than 9 million. Its soil is amongst the richest in Africa, ripe for agriculture. Uh, agriculture sector should be, you know, should be encouraged now because, I mean, we have a very wonderful land where even if you can sow a metal nail, so it will grow here. If we can get cheaper food, you know, produced here, which will give us money, uh, we'll be able to eat and the cost of food will come down. But an abundance of fertile land doesn't guarantee food security. Nothing being landed here at docks in the capital, Juba, is from South Sudan. And as presidential advisor Joseph Lagu discovered, the story is the same in the city markets. But it shouldn't have to be this way. This is the state of Western Equatoria in the south of the country. Local people call it the Garden of Eden for its lush vegetation. It should be able to feed all of South Sudan, but the long war with the north made this impossible. This war, this is a struggle, has taken over around 50 something years for the people of South Sudan to get their freedom. So it was not possible for people in order to, to do especially agricultural activities properly in order to produce enough food that can supply the whole Sudan. But although the civil war ended in 2005, the food at this market in the state capital, Yambio, is barely enough to feed the local population. And walking through the market, the reasons begin to become apparent. Security is everywhere. And when the deputy governor of Western Equatoria invites us to view a small piece of land being prepared for producing vegetables, he doesn't travel alone. Right here, we are not very safe. That's why we come with all these uh, secret forces to be around us. Our problem in the bush is the insecurity. And the main one is the insecurity created by the Lord's resistant army, which is a Ugandan rebel who have moved into the area and devastating and attacking and killing people. They choose isolated villages whereby people are just busy with their own daily activities. They just appear all of a sudden and then start butchering these people. The Lord's Resistance Army, or LRA, is led by this man, Joseph Konye, who declares himself the spokesman of God and is wanted for crimes against humanity. Founded in Uganda over two decades ago, they've crossed the borders into various African countries, including South Sudan. The way they kill people is so bad. They mutilate the body in the sense that it is very impossible for you to touch or even to see. You cannot recognize your person. 
your relative who has been killed. So these are the activities that they do the people, and then they burn all the houses. What's particularly frightening about the LRA is that no one appears to know what they actually want. According to the United Nations, they have no clear ideology or agenda. Stealing, raping and killing seems to be their only purpose. And the bush is so thick, they could be waiting anywhere. It is a challenge for us, and we are trying our best as a government to see to it that our people are protected and uh, to be safe wherever they are. He may sound determined, but these are his frontline soldiers in the battle to combat the heavily armed LRA. They used to be called the Arrow Boys, but now they're known as the Home Guard. The last attack was this week on Sunday. That was on 20, 28. Just three days ago? 20, yeah, just three days ago. And all of them were armed. They were seven in number. Kalashnikovs? Kalashnikovs, they came. Are you really going to ask these men, some of them young, some of them very old, with rudimentary weapons, homemade guns, spears, arrows, are you going to ask them to go into the bush and fight the LRA? This is what we have been doing within this four, four, four years now. All of them, when even if you just hear now there is a LRA coming this way, you will find all, this, all the men, young boys will go there. But why don't you arm them properly? Arming them properly will not be possible for us as a new state. And also arming uh, an untrained group of people like that also in the long run will be dangerous because once the guns are in their, in their hands and if this fight against LRA is over, how can you get the guns back? For the foreseeable future, the one state that could feed the nation will be held to ransom by armed marauders from a neighboring country. But whatever difficulties the country faces, there is one word of hope on everyone's lips. What we have as a common wealth today is oil. We will control our resources. We have a lot of resources here, even water, even gum Arabic, even oil. Yeah, there is, there is that money which comes from the oil. But the reality is that oil revenues won't even come close to solving the country's problems. Hundreds of schools and hospitals need to be built and an entirely new infrastructure created. It will take $10 billion to provide electricity to all the citizens of the country. It will take about eight to $10 billion to connect all the 10 capitals of our 10 states to Yuba by paved roads. That is not small change for a country whose current annual budget is $2 billion. Over 90% of the population live on less than a dollar a day. But in the capital Juba, business is booming. All across the city, major construction projects are in full swing. The other states, some of them actually producing the oil, are angry. What is here in Juba? All the people of South Sudan are living in states, in the counties. So really, if there is money, if there is money with the government of South Sudan, this money should come to the states. Anything that comes always goes to the government of Southern Sudan, take a big chunk and only a very small percent is given to the states. 98% of the country's income comes from oil, but the government feels it's created a fair method of sharing revenues by giving oil-producing states an extra 2%. The rest is distributed to the wider southern Sudan. So we have an equitable wealth sharing formula. Not even members of his own government agree that the system is helping the majority of the population, most of whom live in desperate conditions outside the capital. We have to have programs. The political class, the, the bureaucracy, the, all of us, the government, 
we have to come up with priorities that are citizen focused and policies that are citizen focused. Without that, that is how we give the impression to, the, to rural areas, to small towns, that all the money is being consumed in Juba. In the border town of Malakal, in Upper Nile State, where there has been virtually no development, Aban Rafael accuses government officials in Juba of keeping the money for themselves. This money go to their pockets. They are paying themselves there in Juba. Here is not rich the estate. They say that the estate is to get their own money and pay these people. Where are the, where is the estate going to get money? All around Juba, affluent suburbs are rising from the dirt. With poverty rife and massive unemployment in a country relying mostly on foreign aid, some are beginning to ask where the money's coming from. The other day when I was going through some of the neighborhoods and you hear that that house belongs to so-and-so and that house belongs to so-and-so and somebody has three or four houses, you begin to wonder how much do they make? This is the sort of thing that gives our people a sense that Juba is stealing from everybody else. In today's South Sudan, corruption is endemic and goes right to the heart of government, where many believe ministers look after their own families ahead of anyone else. Nepotism is, is part of the problem, for sure. Some government officials try to favor their relatives in access to government services and access to but contracts. We're talking millions of dollars here. Yes. It's already public knowledge that government officials and private businesses have siphoned off hundreds of millions of dollars in oil revenues. It's even claimed that some senior ministers have avoided prosecution by threatening to produce documents that implicate other ministers in government. They are in school already or not? Former child soldier John Makachek is a campaigner on behalf of the homeless. Uh, we are now at the heart of the government of Southern Sudan ministries. To get something quickly, you must, uh, you must really have something to give to someone so that you can get the services you want. It's all about money. Everything's all about money. People are learning a very bad culture. Where is the money all going? Uh, money goes to individual pockets, and so uh, that's why you see some people are rich, are buying big houses, nice houses, big cars. It's a bad animal. We are trying to fight it hard, and uh, hopefully we will succeed. We have created anti-corruption uh, commission. We are thinking of giving it also the powers to prosecute. I have seen some of the people working in the commission of the corruption and and I asked them you know what have you done what about this and that and then they will say yeah we're trying to lessen the corruption what about this zero tolerance why are we lessening it we should be you know stopping it but the institutions that are there to fight corruption are not doing their job but if this person is corrupt and we know that this person is corrupt why not get his name into the papers and say this person is corrupt Tell that to Niall Ball, editor of The Citizen, South Sudan's first ever newspaper. He has been arrested on numerous occasions for publishing stories about fraud at the top. I have named two main ministers. The first minister of finance, Arthur uh, we, we were actually in a really crisis with him when we investigated the story. He went to Parliament and told the Parliament that he bought one car for 97000 But when we investigated the, 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 the story, we, we discovered that he transferred $60 million to the, the dealer. Ball is referring to the purchase of 153 vehicles, mainly top-of-the-range SUVs for ministers and senior civil servants. $60 million was reportedly paid, making an average price of 400,000 each. The minister involved was never prosecuted. Who decided that these are the kinds of cars we need as a government? Who decided that we have to buy these expensive cars? What happened to regular cars that we used to drive during the war? For myself, this is the real corruption. 
because cars are not immediate things for the country which is young. The development should have been first with few cars, in my opinion. Even here now, some ministers, they have three, four cars. What for? But for those who raise accusations of corruption publicly, there are consequences. So when we uh, report this story, he first of all arrested me. 16 armed people were brought here in a very chaotic situation. I could not even understand because uh, I'm a normal person. I can easily be arrested by a woman with a stick, not uh, armed people, actually. It doesn't demand that situation. Another scandal featured in the Citizen newspaper involved a key project to create emergency grain stores around the country in case of famine. In this particular instance, $2 billion has gone missing. There are people, a lot of people are opposed that we are fighting corruption and we are fighting dictatorship. And then most of these people who are in the government are dictators and they are uh, corrupt. And that's why uh, they don't want me. And they don't want the media, uh, the, the media in general. He does have one ally in presidential advisor Joseph Lagu, chairman of the board at The Citizen. Lagu's angry at the arrests, worried that the security apparatus in the south has learned lessons from an old enemy. Possibly they are influenced by the behavior of the security in the, in the north. north. Yeah, part of them they, were they, in the they, north. they should know that uh, we fought against the north because of that ill uh, behavior of northern security, which they don't have to copy here. But in today's South Sudan, someone is always interested in what you're doing. Are you security? In some cases, whenever we assign a reporter to go and investigate, he will go and get harassment and he will get intimidation. Many reporters have been resigning from us because they don't want to discuss certain things. Are they frightened? Yeah, they always uh, intimidate them, they threaten them. And, and even we have, uh, when this police uh, is, uh, beat our driver, they, they, the witness have been taken out of town by police up to now. They have been asked to leave Juba so that if there is a court case, they will not be a witness. With all the wealth concentrated in Juba, Hundreds are arriving here every week to escape the poverty of the countryside, only to end up in slums across the city. Juba's population has more than tripled from 160,000 in 2005 to over half a million today. John Makacek has been fighting government attempts to push the slum dwellers out of the city. So the place is not yours now, you are just here temporarily? Yes, temporarily, yeah. Uh, any time, any day, any minute, you will be asked to leave. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's, uh, that's incredible. Yeah. John then led us to Juba's main graveyard, the only spot the latest arrivals could find to build their shacks. A human being cannot live here. They smell of people who die here. And even the people are not uh, uh, really buried properly here, so you can smell them bad. But they live here now, so I don't know where they should go. They tell them just go. They have no choice but to live here, because that's the only space where they can find and live. Slums and local markets are being cleared to make way for big business to take advantage of opportunities arising in the world's newest country. I don't think they are Sudanese companies. They are all foreign companies. And so they're coming with money, and the money has people to live. It just happened like what happened in, upper, in, uh, in uh, Unity States. Most of oil companies now have evacuated people to live, and so citizens are really suffering. It's not just Juba and Unity State. In a land grab which could turn into the biggest scandal yet, foreign companies have already taken over an area larger than the entire country of Rwanda. In some cases, the land will be used for forestry and biofuels. In others, no one seems to know. I would be surprised if corruption wasn't a factor of many of these deals. 
many of the investments were done without consultation. Uh, you have an investment project not far from, he from here in Juba, which is 10,000 square kilometers for $25,000 in fees plus uh, a portion of the profits from the investment. Uh, you know, tremendously important land, which has been leased away for a very uh, insignificant sum. This is the very land that those in government once fought for, that their people suffered for, and that is now being sold or leased for little in return. The transformation from a liberation movement to a political party has been a difficult one. In the past, they fought a common enemy in the north, but now the future holds great uncertainty. We are going to have difficulties because what, you, what unites us in the past was our frustration from the north. But now the, the north has gone. What, what will bring us together? That's not. The new constitution of South Sudan gives wide-ranging powers to President Salva Kiir including the right to sack all 10 elected state governors and to appoint his own members of parliament. It's hardly surprising that many fear we are witnessing the beginning of a one-party state. This constitution was done by SVLM alone. That's why these opposition parties pull away from me. I thought you were SPLM. Yes, I am. But now you're worried? Yes, I'm worried. Aban Raphael's concerns reflect many voices across the country. And with intertribal violence and corruption spiraling, rather than Khartoum, their greatest enemy may now be themselves. Uh, I think some of our brothers uh, forget the reason why we fought for this uh, many years. They have not lived up to the people's expectations. These are revolutionaries. These are people who fought and spent a decade in the bush going on nothing, not being paid, volunteering, being injured. You, we would have expected them to carry on with that kind of sacrifices, at least to, until we develop this country into a comfortable place that we can all live in.